because I inevitably forget. So we will be recording the meeting. I've been posting these to the Moodle if everybody uh, has had a chance to get in. It looks like most people have accessed that. Um, if you have any trouble, please let me know and we can, I'll help you fix that or I can just send you links directly to, no problem. Okay, so let me share my screen. Oh, thanks, Liz. I think it, I think our my co-facilitators who are on the call, Natalie and Carly, have done an amazing job. Right, so fun to see different facilitators rather than just tuning in to hear me every week or something. <laughs> you know, it's, it is nice. And Karen was sharing earlier that one of the things about not being able to be in person is it's really difficult to sort of get those ideas and how other people would do things and because um, we all look at things a little differently. So it is fun to, to I'd like to bring in as many different educators and speakers as I can to these types of things because we, I think we all become better educators um, by learning from other people. And I am not below stealing your ideas. So, <laughs> all right, let me share this screen and we will get started. All right, are you seeing my PowerPoint? Excellent. Got a pretty full hour. All right, so this is, I'm Megan Bow. I think, um, so many of you have, have seen me the last few weeks, but I work for the Environmental Education Association. I am the state coordinator for Project Learning Tree as well as Project Wild and various other things for the association. But um, so we had a very generous grant through the Sustainable Forestry Initiative to put this program together and be able to offer it at a very affordable price. Um, and we wanted to highlight Project Learning Tree as part of that. So the Sustainable Forestry Initiative um, basically, they own Project Learning Tree. They own the copyrights. They provide a lot of the support uh, in financial support and professional support for Project Learning Tree across the United States and Canada and Japan and Mexico. So it is an international program. So um, I, and this is really fun for me. I don't often do workshops in January or February. So this activity, Evergreens in Winter from the guide, is was kind of a new activity for me too. So I've had a lot of fun kind of digging into it and trying out some of these experiences and, and figuring out my own modifications that I'll share today that, that might work for you as well. But um, let's see, a few weeks ago, I took this picture we had. I'm at the very Northern part of Illinois, real close to the Wisconsin border. And um, so we're, we're, we're very north, Northern weather influenced. And it's been quite, it's, we've been snow covered since the end of the year and it's been pretty cold and it's been really actually a really lovely winter. But a few weeks ago, we received or we had some warming temperatures and there was snow on the ground and then we had all this fog develop and the temperatures dropped that night, very cold. And we had this beautiful, what they refer to as a hoar frost, H-O-A-R, hoar frost. And everything in the morning was covered with these gorgeous crystals. The picture doesn't even do it justice. So this is just an, an, a spruce tree in my front yard. And it has all these gorgeous sort of three-dimensional crystals and they were all over everything. <laughs> it was beautiful. So I really love winter. I enjoy winter and winter activities and being outdoors in winter. And um, one of the reasons I was excited to offer this in January is because sometimes uh, people sort of burrow in and they don't want to they don't want to come out or get their kids out in winter or their students out in winter and um, trying to show that it really can be a lot of fun and it can be done safely and there's a lot to experience and learn in these these winter months. So today we'll be we'll be taking a closer look at evergreens in winter that's activity number six in your guidebook uh, if you wanted to follow along. So project learning tree, the philosophy and methods used by project learning tree. So this guide really is about just trying to provide some ideas and guidance and it's a very flexible type of guide. You can easily pick and choose what works for you. 
Um, but it's really about just trying to provide experiences and getting kids outdoors or bringing nature and the outdoors indoors um, to just have a richer experience if you're if you're looking to to integrate nature-based education, which I know we all are because you all signed up to participate. So the philosophy by Project Learning Tree and Diana Williams on Tuesday's call, she made this point I thought really well. You know, you don't have to be an environmental educator or a naturalist to really just be successful and create these rich experiences for kids. Just getting them outdoors and beginning with very simple experiences. I love she used an example of she they, she started by just um, having snack outside or having story time outside. Very simple things, but it just changes. It's a whole new environment and a new experience for your for your students or your kids when you do that. And of course, we know with early learning and early childhood, it's really important to be engaging all those senses. So they experience their world through through their senses and they're learning through senses and experiences. Um, and that that is developmentally um, best practice for this for this age group. And whenever you can, you want to provide choices to students, put out materials, put, put supplies, materials out, and really give them the freedom to choose, let them use their imaginations, um, and not put too many parameters or guidelines or expectations on, on what, what you want them to be doing. And again, that emphasizes the experience of the activity or what you're doing and not so much the end product or the facts that they're able to, you know, repeat back to you or, you know, be able to, to that rote memory piece where they can recite or repeat back. It's it, this nature-based learning and environmental education is really about about experiences. And it's also, it fits very easily into the sciences and math sometimes, but it's so important and it um, can be beautifully done to make it multi-dimensional, which is integrating music and movement, art literature, dramatic play, all of those things that early childhood learners really need to have a complete experience and to consider that whole child um, learning methodology. So keeping children actively involved, we all know play is super important. The research tells us how important play is and guided play and um, to provide those opportunities and of course engaging families to continue those learning activities and extensions and enrichment, providing some ideas for those kids and families to be doing outside of your, your classrooms. For many of you, you're in a traditional classroom. So the guide itself, they had sort of broken into three themed areas and exploring nature with the five senses, experiencing, tree, experiencing trees through the seasons and meeting neighborhood trees. So over these three Saturdays, we've picked one activity from each of those three themed areas. And today we're talking about the evergreens in winter, the seasonal activity. And this is my son on the left. He is 11. He is not an early childhood at this point, but I just, he built this small snow cave and managed to get himself in there. And I, I think snow play is, is really fun and can be done with very young students. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about evergreens themselves. So evergreens are conifers or cone bearing trees. So their seeds are within that cone and they retain their foliage, their needles all year round. But there's, with any rule, there is always an exception, right? So what you see here, this is a larch tree. It is the one needle bearing cone producing tree that drops all of its needles every fall. And this one happens to be at the end of my street. So I snapped a picture and it totally looks like a dead evergreen tree. But come spring, it will, it will needle, needle out, it will leaf out um, and be beautiful all summer and into the fall. And we would refer to that as like a deciduous uh, 
needle tree. So deciduous trees are oaks and maples and birches and such that drop their leaves every year. So uh, a larch falls into that deciduous category. So overwintering is extremely stressful for trees and evergreens have developed these very unique and interesting um, techniques, characteristics that help them survive sub-zero temperatures, uh, ice, snow, blowing winds, etc. And they do that, they are able to produce what essentially is their own antifreeze and it's a cryoprotectant. Uh, and so I don't know, has anybody ever accident or your refrigerator is too cold and you have lettuce in there and that lettuce ends up freezing in the refrigerator and the next day you pull it out and it is like limp <laughs> and mushy. So if the evergreen trees weren't able to produce their own antifreeze, those needles would would freeze at a cellular level and it would be uh, totally lethal. It would be death to the tree, right? And um, so that is a super unique characteristic that evergreens have developed for survival in very harsh conditions. And the other very um, unique thing is their, their structure. So they're very triangular, typically very triangular in shape and they have these beautiful long sweeping bow branches that come down and out from that trunk. And that's an intentional design by nature so that those the snow and the ice can slough off those branches. They're flexible, where if you think of uh, an oak or a maple limb, it's very, um, very strong. You can hang a tire swing on them. Uh, you can climb them. Where evergreens, you can climb them, but, but those boughs and branches, they give a lot more. And so that they don't crack and break off, hopefully, underneath heavy ice and snow in the winter. So let's look at evergreens and keep in mind needles are just modified leaves. So needles just like other tree leaves are the um, food factories for that tree. They produce the sugar in the food through photosynthesis that those trees need to survive. And there is a wide variety of evergreens and cones to take a look at. So when I'm out and about a lot of times I will just I will collect things and I'll have a little a bag or backpack or my pockets, <laughs> you know, I'll just, I'm able to, you know, pick stuff up when I'm out in neighborhood walks or I ask my neighbors, can I take a trimming of that or um, pull a cone off there and, you know, and they don't mind. So I put that in my pocket and over, over time, I kind of make this collection of things. And in the classroom setting, it's really great to have something of a touch table um, and be introducing live specimens whenever you can using natural materials is always preferred versus um, replicas um, or photographs um, when you can use use the real deal. So let me see here. I'm going to I'm going to switch my camera. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. So I'm going to go back and forth in this presentation. I have a camera I can move and kind of angle down so you can see what I see on my desk. And this is how we're going to kind of go through some of the activities today. Um, so bear with me for just a second. Let me stop the share. So you don't have to see the camera. <laughs> There it is. Okay. So this is a, a, a collection of things that I, I had gone out in my own yard and I had snipped some fresh evergreens. Um, and I had in my collection of cones, I mentioned I, I will be out and about and sometimes I just pick these things up. And so having a sample of evergreens, twigs and cones. Anita's got some leaves and twigs. She came with some samples. So I will, when I trim trees after a storm, you know, I might pick these things up and add them to my, my nature box. You can kind of see that. 
And we want to invite, make an invitation for kids. One of the, the activities or the experiences I like is to in, in, an invitation to sort. Okay, so let me go back. Okay. Okay, you should be seeing the PowerPoint again. And an invitation to sort. So those items I showed you, I would, you know, ask them, give them the freedoms, you know, provide the materials and the resources, and then ask them um, to come up or give them the freedom, give them the choice to come up with their own method of sorting or developing categories and, and engaging their senses by, you know, having to touch. So one of, one of the things I like in, in Evergreens and Winter Activity is they refer to a very a simple way that probably one of the first ways they might come up with is the ones, the evergreens that are tickly, as in very soft, and the evergreens that are prickly, very sharp. So some of those spruce trees, for example, have very sharp pointed end needles, um, where fir trees are nice and soft. Okay, next slide here. And how will they choose to sort? So they, they might come up with any, any a variety of ways in looking at all those materials. They might choose say size or shape or weight. Um, for real young learners, you could have literally bigs and littles, <laughs> just in size, or tickly and pricklies. Those are sort of simple things that young learners can do and start developing their own uh, categories and sorting techniques. And then this is um, something I learned from Marilyn Brink in a, in a training, uh, and Mark actually, Mark and Marilyn had put a training on I attended several years ago. And one of my big takeaways was the use of I notice or I see statements, the language and how you're communicating with, with young learners. Um, instead of saying, great job, I love what you did, those could be um, construed as as judging statements. Um, and so really sticking with I notice and I see statements reinforces what that child is doing, um, what you're sort of mirroring their language and what they're doing and avoiding, trying to avoid questions and evaluation statements, such as I said, like, I love that, that's beautiful, um, I, what you've done is perfect, um, and really sticking with um, I see, I see the patterns you've picked, or I see uh, how you've sorted the cones, and I see that you've, you've taken the small ones and put them in this box, or you know, something like that. In prompts, using, um, instead of, and there are appropriate times to use questions, but you just wanna be intentional about them um, and approach them as, what do you think or I wonder type of questions so that they're providing you the answer. You're not really guiding them or evaluating them or putting them on the spot as in quizzing them or, or you wouldn't want to give them the impression that um, they're doing anything wrong because in these sorts of experiences, there really is no wrong or right. If they're sorting, it's really how they've decided to do it. And you've given them the freedom and the choice to do that. So you just want to reinforce and support um, how they're doing it. All right, so this is our first break. I'm going to do um, switch back the camera and we're gonna take a look at painting with evergreen. So if some of you brought your paints with you and you have some evergreen sprigs um, and other natural things that you would like to do a little painting, I'm just gonna demonstrate just a simple way and a few methods that I've done this in the past. Um, so, okay, so let's stop the share. Okay. Transition. Sorry, I know this is a little clumsy. Um, 
All right, so I just have some paints I'll put on my plate. And paper, I like to use um, paper bags too. If you're going out on a walk and you want them to be able to collect little things or an adventure as Carly would refer to it. Grownups take walks and kids have adventures. Um, I use paper bags for a lot of things. These I've cut off the top so they're a little smaller. I use these to create nests as well. But in this case we're going to paint an activity collection bag as well as I've got paper. And you can create bundles. So this is just a boxwood in my front. And I just rubber band the end and create this bundle for, for painting with. Um, or you can literally attach them to a stick if, if you would prefer to have a handle. Some kids might do better, better being able to grasp. Um, or you can simply take a branch and a single type branch and make imprints or paint. So I'm just gonna try this online and just kind of show you how this might typically, might typically go. Maybe I want to put a stick there like my trunk of my tree. Just making shapes and imprints. It'll paint. I'm gonna put a little snow on my tree. We are expecting lots of snow here today. Something kind of like that. Maybe we'll make a print. like that. If anybody else has ideas to share on how they might modify this, and other ideas of what could be painted. I, I might put a big, a big paper on the wall and do it um, to make a big, you know, a bigger tree in their minds, you know. Yeah, like Might, a mural, like yeah, something you can hang. Yeah, I love it. It's really pretty. <laughs> it is, and it's fun, and you get all kinds of textures. Um, and kids love to paint, right? <laughs> you could potentially also use that chalk paint and do it outside, and then maybe eliminate some of the mess a little bit. Sometimes that chalk paint is a little bit hard to work with, but then you could do, and they could go and look at it for a couple of days or they could show their friends at recess or whatever, if it's in a yeah. uh, joined space and that might be something fun as well. We yeah, do it. Um, we do a similar activity where they do nature brushes on a big canvas and then we hang it up um, at the beginning of every class. Session. They know that they're like entering our classroom space because we have an outdoor classroom and it, they love seeing it every day. They're like, woohoo, we're at school now. Yeah, I love it would make a great idea for an art show. <clears throat> yeah, I'm leaving that, the outdoor classroom. You are, you're so lucky, Elizabeth. You have a whole outdoor setup. <laughs> outdoor classroom is probably too fancy of a word. We're just outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, but so this is one of those activities. Nice, Nita. I love it. So this is a great one to do outside, right? Um, another recommendation you, I think you'll see in the book is um, snow painting using spray bottles with 
um, watered down food coloring or watered down temper paint uh, and spraying the snow. I think that's a really great, very sensory and really beautiful um, activity. And very, you know, no cleanup virtually, just maybe some hands. <laughs> I see there's some things in the chat. Just let me know if I am missing a question or something. Okay. Let me see here. Let's go back. Oops. Hold on. I have messed up my PowerPoint here. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out the best way to go back and forth with, <laughs> without investing in, you know, a lot of equipment, which seems totally doable. Okay, so here we are. We're back at Evergreens in winter. And the main activity there, or your featured activity, was about creating winter treats and creating um, not just for the birds, but thinking about other wildlife visitors that might uh, be coming into your area and how, especially in these snowy, cold-covered months, um, you know, they're, they're hungry. They're looking for, for things to eat. So featuring treats. Oh, I am way back here. Hold on. All right. So probably many of us have done the um, sort of simple pine cone feeder, which um, is very easy, very doable, not doesn't require a lot of resources either. But I wanted to share some other really great ideas. So I have a good friend and her um, her COVID activity has, she's really gotten into bird watching from her home. And she has created these beautiful I, winter treat ideas, you know, and there's tons of ideas on the internet, of course. So I wanted to share, she had, and she's a photographer as well. So she had created these and taken some beautiful pictures that I wanted to share um, because I just think they're, they're really beautiful and they're very clever and they work. So she has all kinds of bird visitors to these, these winter treats. What you're seeing here on the, on the, the slide is your, your supplies. So it's basically old, it doesn't have to be old, pie tins and uh, muffin tins, or this one is a silicone type muffin uh, form, bird seed thistle, string or yarn, and she's used fresh cranberries in some evergreen clippings. So step one, she's kind of taken her pie pans, she, put, she had put the cranberries in first, added the evergreen sprigs, in step two, then goes in the, the seed and the thistle, adds water. So she fills the, the pie pans and the muffin tins and then puts the twine or string in. And these, these just get put outside and they freeze. And then they pop right out and you have these beautiful frozen discs of winter treats. And so you can see there's some gold finches visiting those. Then the one, this other, the one on the right is another alternative and I have posted in the Moodle several ideas, um, recipes that I have found have worked well. Um, simple, a lot of it is just stuff you have around the house. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's gelatin and, um, peanut butter and cornmeal and stuff like that, you might, it's readily available. But the, where you see this little woodpecker, this downy woodpecker, he's on a, what was, it was a circular, almost like a wreath shape. And that one is using gel, gelatin and, um, oh, it's not, it's um, corn syrup, gelatin, corn syrup, a little bit of flour. That recipe's in the Moodle as well. And you actually put it in a bunt pan and you let it sit for about 24 hours and it will harden up 
pops out of there. You might want to spray the bump pan a little bit first, pops out of there, and then you're able to hang it in the tree. And you can see they do, it works. They come and they, they visit. And um, I did get a squirrel who was, he was like an acrobat. You see that big chunk out of there. He was, he was going to town. But I, I enjoy watching the squirrels as well. I don't have so many that they become a nuisance, <laughs> but they're hungry too. Another really um, beautiful and functional uh, is creating garlands. And you can see that blue jay wants that peanut. Okay, so the pine cone feeder. So this is uh, sort of that simple feeder kids have been making for, you know, through the, through the ages. So this is, I enlisted the help of some of my, my neighbor, my neighbor kids, and um, we made pine cone feeders and instruments that day. But this is Ty, and he's adding the peanut butter to the corn meal here. Um, I will be transitioning and showing you some of these things. Uh, we found the, if anybody's done the cornmeal mixture, I'm going to show you it's, it's not tremendously sticky. They went five parts cornmeal to peanut butter. Um, I thought that was a lot of cornmeal. <laughs> I'll show you how that looks. And you really have to fill it into a wide cone. Um, a lot of the cones I have are, are these, these spruce type cones and they're pretty narrow and so he found it was easier really for him to spread that peanut butter with a knife and then use the use the seed here's his sister brooke yeah and so i have a, a tray of seed you can see the half oranges are another nice uh, way to hold seed so uh, if you juice oranges or you know scoop them out to to eat oranges, save the shells. They puncture very easily. I used um, pipe cleaner. I found worked better than string because they're very wobbly and tipsy. The pipe cleaner makes them much more stable. Um, and you can see we just filled those with seed and Brooke's got those in her box and we're, we're you saw a picture of her earlier in the slide where she was hanging them on a tree outside. All right, so these are these are the supplies that I pulled together for this project. Uh, pipe cleaners or yarn, cones, peanut butter. If you can, it's always better to use peanut butter that it is peanuts and water. <laughs> uh, any peanut butter really is okay and it works, but um, fewer ingredients and additives, of course, the better for our, for our bird friends, the cornmeal seeds, the half oranges that you see, and then some measuring tools. All right, I'm gonna switch back and show you. Okay. Has everybody done these before or some variation of a bird feeder using kind of so this is the cornmeal mixture the peanut butter and cornmeal so you can see it's really it's very granular um, and but not real sticky so it might work okay and like a very wide cone I could really pack it in there I might have to add a little peanut butter to get that to stick um, but honestly, I wasn't real in love with that mixture. So I think what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to do that bunt pan mixture and add the cornmeal and peanut butter with the gelatin and the, maybe a little corn syrup and flour and create that bunt pan wreath. And I think that will be, it'll be excellent in that, in that format. So what I really think for the pine cone feeder, um, just using peanut butter and a nice mix of seeds. 
to you know brush it on and then roll it around and this is so see grid seed feels so good to get your hands in right so kids are going to love this and a great another great activity to do outdoors and then just create this nice little cone i just created just a little feeder tie your string on it's a little easier if you do it first and then go outside and hang that in all the trees around your facility. Ah. Okay. All right. So I, I'm gonna just leave the camera where it is and move right into our next exercise. And this is about um, creating a story, reading and writing a story. Well, I better hurry or we've got run out of time. <laughs> uh, so this is one of the books we're gonna give away today. It's called A Stranger in the Woods. And I just wanna share just a little bit about the, the premise of this book. It is just um, photographs. And it's all about the idea um, two kids have created a snowman and they've, they've put wildlife treats into their snowman, a carrot nose and nuts and bird seed and corn. And then they watch to see who visited the stranger in the woods. And so it's really lovely done. So the animals, they wake in the morning and they start, they figure out the blue jay starts to call and the deers notice that there's there's something new happening in the woods. There's a stranger there and they're very curious. And they're talking about it and investigating and they're in the book they're sort of communicating with one another. And they're trying to figure out, they spot where the the stranger is and they're trying to figure out, you know, who's who's going to go in and see what the stranger is all about. Who's brave enough? Who's scared to go? The timid rabbit and the brave chickadee going to go check it out. The mouse is going to dig a, a snow tunnel to the snowman and, and spy, see what what she sees in the doe. And there they are, they figure out, oh, this stranger is a good stranger, right? This, this stranger has, has treats and food for them. Love the, the doe takes the carrot. And so the idea, and there's, there's the kids watching from the evergreens to see who visits visits their their winter treat tree for wildlife and then they add a little bit more and then they're headed home right always i think that's just a very sweet book and would go along well with the treats that you all create and put outside for your for your young learners okay We'll go back to sharing here. We're going to create our own story. We're going to do this quickly, or I might just demo it just so we have enough time to got some other fun things. Okay, there it goes. So stranger in the woods, we're going to do a jam board. Um, and Natalie introduced a jam board last week. This is just a little different way that you can do that with uh, creating a story if you're online or if you're virtual. Um, but you could think of this as a classroom activity. Too many of you probably have felt boards or different ways, um, large paper pads, things that magnets, puppets, things you do to create stories from, from your, your, your early learners' ideas. So let's head over to Jamboard. I did have a quick question, Megan, about bird feeders, and I know you're trying to quick kind of, yeah. can you use dried fruit as well as like 
if I want to do this, this program with my kids this week, but I only have dried fruit, that would work too, right? Yeah. So if you can find less sugar, better. Yeah. So if you can not added sugar or whatever, no yeah. artificial sugars. Yeah. 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 A dried fruit is dried food's great. Okay. Yeah. Or if you have a dehydrator, if you really want to go that extra. <laughs> if you're looking to give me another excuse to buy a dehydrator, I'm just looking every day. So, all right. Yeah. Sorry. I, Quick- I, I, I mean, you're cooking for your wildlife, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm doing the, I'm doing the best for the world right now. That's really yeah. what it is. Are you, you know, your oven on very low heat will dehydrate too. Perfect. You know? Kind of check that out. So if you didn't want the full on dehydrator. Okay, so we're going to take a look at Jamboard real quick here. I'm going to pop this link in the chat for you. I think I have shared it correctly. And then let's take a look at it. Okay. Everyone seeing the stranger in the woods, the snowman? Okay, let me reduce this. So if you clicked on the link in the chat, you will be able to add a sticky note to our Jamboard story. So um, I'm doing this because you're all adults and we can read and, and type. Of course, early learners, you'll need photographs and I'll show you an alternative way. Um, Megan, I don't see the link in the chat. Um, we don't. Right now, we just see your desktop. It, we had it up for a second, um, but now it's just a desktop. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's because I gave it to Natalie. I don't know why it went to you privately. Can you share it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, why. oh, I could see it fine. I don't know what everyone's <laughs> saying. But yeah, it's because I'm the only one that has it. <laughs> I feel really special right now. Right here, let me make, I'm sorry. These are all these, these little tech issues. There, are. you should be able there to see that, in the, that now. Yep, thanks. And um, I'm sharing our Stranger in the Woods jam board. I yep. see. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so how Jamboard works, in this left-hand column, you'll see um, a, a bar of tools. And in this case, we wanna create a story about, um, you've created treats with your young learners in your classrooms or with your kiddos, and you want um, now to put those out and talk about the animals that, might, that you might see come and enjoy your treats. So you can find the sticky note here, right in the middle, here it is. It's a white box with kind of two little black lines. Some people are using that and you can click on that. You can try to answer these questions for me. What animal might eat our treats? And then what will happen when the animals find our treats? So it's just kind of a fun way um, to start creating what will be the, the base of your own story. Deer and Rapson, maybe you've read the book already and they already have an idea of the types of animals that might be um, living well, near them. Uh, most people I would think have rabbits and mouse and deer and such. Lots of birds, blue jays that would come and visit. Awesome, and you can grab those sticky notes and move them around. This is a really fun tool. If you find yourself working with other adult learners or if you're online with kids, it's, it's, it's kind of a fun way to interact. <laughs> the blue jay. The blue jay is a little bit of a bully. When the blue jay shows up, all the other small bird, they all leave, don't they? Yeah. I see all the small, the juncos and the chickadees and the, and the finches. They're all sort of waiting their turn on the outskirts, waiting for those jays and sometimes woodpeckers to, to get out of the way. 
All right. Voles. Yeah. And then I created a second one. I'm just, I'll show you for time's sake. I'm going to advance this slide here. So if you're working with um, your, your early learners. These are some of on the right might be what your treats you created look like, for examples. And then you could provide pictures or provide um, of some of the animals that might, I put these in for you, but um, kids, you could certainly lay out a bunch of animals or they could, they could just tell you and you could pull pictures. I don't know how you might want to do that. I'd love to hear how you might um, think about using this because you all are the practitioners. You're, you're out there on you know, a day-to-day -day basis working with early learners, um, but providing some of those images for them. And it's the same sort of thing, you know, maybe that mouse, that mouse is underneath that feeder here and he's, he's picking up all that extra seed. Okay. Maybe the chickadee, the chickadee's sitting on top of that cone, but you can see how you can start to try to put together a story about, about your own treat tree and and your winter wildlife and your own sort of stranger on your school facility grounds. Feel free to unmute or pop in the chat any ideas that you have or how you might wanna, how you might see yourself using this type of activity. Okay. I think it would be cool to do it as a charting activity. You know, you could do it over a week, maybe even of, of class and you could put your feeder out on or at the beginning part of the week and kind of keep track of the birds throughout the week that you see there or, or just animals, creatures in general. And then you can make a chart, you know, on your wall or whatever. Each time a kid sees a new species or, or type of animal, you could have them go and move something onto a felt board or something like that. I think it would be really fun to um, do the story and, and create the story and then also make it a real life observation activity as well. Sure. You can integrate some, some math ideas pretty easily for that. Yeah, I like that too, Liz. All right, so let's go back to the um, PowerPoint. Oh, no, 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 current slide. All right, so you should be seeing the PowerPoint at this point. Let's see, we're about 10 minutes out. So outdoor adventures, we talked about, I wanted to, um, Carly had made that great point a couple Saturdays ago that kids really look at outdoor walks and exploration as an adventure. So um, getting outside and looking for these things. And in the, in the, your guide provides you with a nice list uh, I just grabbed a few that I like from there and popped them in this presentation. It gives you all kinds of ideas of things that maybe you should be looking for or thinking about when you're on these outdoor adventures. And this doesn't have to be a long walk. This is, you know, can just be done outside on school grounds, your backyard, uh, something they can do at home. This would be a great sort of home extension activity. So I spent some time over the past few weeks looking for signs of animals because we've had a lot of snow. Uh, so tracks are a great way <clears throat> to look for and see evidence that animals have been there. And so I've been, you know, sort of out and about just in my own space and I found rabbit tracks. You can see where their paw, their little tail end would hit sort of as they were leaping through the snow. Uh, this was right outside my garage. This is a what what mice do, or sometimes voles too. I think they will tunnel through the snow. You can see this and pop out and tunnel back through. And on the other end of that were these little tiny footprints. <laughs> like there's been a mouse about. <laughs> you can see the mouse feet. Maybe looks like some more rabbit. Uh, squirrel, I think, and maybe raccoon on the left. And this one was right down my front sidewalk. And I think maybe it's a fox. Some of my other environmental ed or naturalist folks out there. Let's see what if they 
think differently. Because we really don't have any cats around and there really there weren't couldn't really see the, the paw print. Um, but we do have fox around here. So back to this outdoor adventure. And so kids, you know, they could be collecting pictures and signs of evidence um, from their homes or around your schoolyard. They'll see lots of bird uh, footprints underneath where your, your winter tree treats are hanging as well. And so I ask you this question, if you were an animal outside in winter, where would you stay? And that's another great prompt um, to let kids sort of think about where would you live and how, how would you stay warm and um, where would you find shelter? And feel free to pop that into the chat if, if you want to think about if you were an animal, what kind of animal would you be and, and where, where would you stay in the middle of winter? Would it be under an evergreen tree? It's popping up. Okay. Great. We are right on time here. The last part, I, I really like the idea of having a woodworking stations or the ability for kids to use um, real tools and work with wood and how to do that safely um, to make a great experience. And Many or a handful of activities in your guide incorporate an aspect of a woodworking activity or woodworking station. Evergreens and winter is one of those. Um, and so I pulled from the book in the appendices, appendix nine. If you haven't explored your, your appendix section, there's a, a lot of really great ideas and resources um, that will, I think, complement the activities very well. And the woodwork, this woodworking section is one of them. So I know it can sound a little scary to give kids tools <laughs> in, in a classroom setting, but I think, you know, if you are interested in nature, integrating nature-based learning, if you are of a nature preschool or a forest school mindset, this is becoming a very commonplace practice. So um, these are some of the tools. Safety goggles, of course, always. Right, sandpaper and files. I included a couple pieces of sandpaper in your activity packet that you received just to kind of get you started. Sandpaper and sanding wood blocks um, are a very easy way to get started in exploring sandpaper. Different grits and textures are very tactile. Lightweight hammers, large headed nails, those are like roofing nails. They have a nice big head, makes it easy to hit. Stubby handled screwdrivers. Um, they're nice and short for small hands, manual drills. They kind of look like the old fashioned type drill where you put it down and you turn it uh, so they can um, put holes into wood blocks, um, C clamps and vices to hold pieces of wood in place while they're working on them. And of course a dustpan and a broom for cleanup and establish, establishing expectations. So of course, safety is the first priority and the tool's purpose, what the tool should be used for um, and what it shouldn't be used for, of course. An adult needs to be present at all times, probably you know, in small groups in this sort of woodworking might work better um, in a manageable storage system. So I think I've been in many preschool classrooms where they provide the picture of the toy or the tool or whichever it is. And, and so that child knows where to, to place that tool back, that where that tool goes, because the picture or the outline matches. All right, and some other suggestions for success. And these are all available in your appendix session, appendix section <laughs> of your guidebook. And this again is Brooke. I will say I almost didn't put it in because I did not have her in safety goggles. <laughs> that is her mother. But I, I do think it, it represent like it really does show um, a lightweight hammer and how she's able to use both hands. Her mom is using the pliers to hold the um, large headed nail and she had a great time hammering in nails. We were making musical instruments, which is part of the sounds around activity in your guide. And she did, she did a great job. So let me just grab a couple things. So if you have the ability to get these, we like to refer to these as tree cookies. 
project learning tree calls them that. They're kind of tree cross sections. Lots of things you can do with uh, tree cookies, counting rings, looking um, for you know symmetry and what might have happened in that tree's life. You know when things are uh, rings are close together or far apart, or there's a, maybe a nick where a branch fell off. Um, great for sorting. But just general wood blocks. We have a lot of this sort of stuff sitting around my house. Um, but if you know a woodworker or a shop or um, a, even a city department, a parks department, they're often um, trimming and cutting and can provide samples of woods and branches and tree cookies for you at, at no cost. And so sanding, the act of sanding and using different grits of sandpaper, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sound and it's texture. And if you use something like pine or cedar, you know, it smells really good for your sense, your sense of smell. Um, so I really love, I love woodworking for young kids and want to encourage all of you to think about doing that as well. All right, I think we are at the top of our hour. It is 9.59. Oh, I'm seeing now, I'm seeing your, um, responses where if you were an animal, where would you, where would you, where would you go? How would you survive? A snow blanket. Snow is a great insulator, right? A lot of animals burrow into the snow. Warm nest, a cozy den, got that nice heavy fur coat, right? Uh, excellent. Okay, we do have a giveaway today. Yeah, we Two yeah. to give away. So two. Yeah. I should have um, everyone who is present who has not previously won something. So double check real quick that I have the right names on there. <laughs> and uh, which which book do you want to give away first, Megan? Why don't we do Stranger in the Woods? Okay, Stranger in the Woods. Let's see. Like it's gonna be doing it. Yeah. Janet, you're still here, right? Yep. Okay, and the other book I have that um, is in your it's one of the recommended books. I really like it. It's it's an older book, but it's poems and painting called Winter Eyes. It's very sweet. That looks neat. I've never seen that one. Let's check out. And Sylvia. Sylvia. All right. Here we go. Is Sylvia here? I want to make sure she's. Looks like she's still here. Okay. Good. Pop those books in the mail. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope. I hope got some great ideas for today, some, some things to start integrating into your own um, programs, your home. So it's so good to see you. I so appreciate all of you who show up and, and, and join in. It's so nice to see everyone each week. Our next presentation is the following Saturday, and it was it is the Chicago Botanic Garden Nature Preschool, the director and lead teacher there, and they're really going to get into winter play and some really great ideas um, that they use and do at the nature preschool there um, and how to do that safely so everybody has a great time and everything. So uh, I'll send out the reminder I do that on Wednesday if you haven't registered yet. And otherwise, have a great weekend. Uh, if you have any questions at all, always feel free to contact me. Yeah. So thank there, you so there, much. Thank you, Megan. Bye. There, there is none on Tuesday then, right? No there. Tuesday. Because I think because they're in their teaching, it was tough for them. They really okay. needed a Saturday morning. Yeah. A little, yes. Okay. Yeah. No Tuesday this week. That's one little change. But 9 a.m. next Saturday. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This awesome. is great. Yeah, thanks, Dan. We'll see uh, you. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.